Welcome to Stocks and Translation, our essential conversation to get through the market mayhem, the noisy numbers, and the hyperbole to give you the information you need for your portfolio. Today, I am joined as always by the people's producer, Sydney Freed, and Mark Newton, who is the global head of tech, uh, technical strategy at Fundstrat. And we're going to be talking about the market, a technician by nature. We're going to get into some other things as well. But let's just get into the docket. What we got planned today tech domination. Uh, we're not just here to point it out. We're going to be saying and uh, figuring out exactly how to play these things. And our phrase of the day is rotation. Uh, sure, it's fun to say, but do stocks and bonds, do they really rotate? We're going to break it down. And this episode brought to you by the number 4.5. That's the closest big magnetic level on the 10-year treasury yield that uh, the bond market is saying. And what is it saying about risk appetite? So Sydney, Mark, let's talk about the story of the week. We've got uh, markets a bit kind of boring lately. We've got volatility dropping. Uh, we've got volumes dropping here. We're in a holiday shortened week, but we're also at record highs. What are, what are we to make of this? You know, the market continues to be incredibly resilient from my own point of view. I mean, it's up about 14 and percent, but really nobody's happy. And I think that's the interesting thing. You know, we're living in a time of you know, obviously difficult political climate, and people are worried about the wars overseas or potential of a growth slowdown, but yet none of that ever really seems to affect the stock market per se. And so you have a tech-led, uh, dominated market, which has done phenomenally well, but there still remain a ton of different companies and stocks that really have not even begun to participate in the rally yet and have really been on the sidelines. So what, what happens when they participate? What's going what's gonna to draw them in? Do you, do you have a time frame for this? And what does it look like? The time frame should be between now and next spring, summer. I, I do think that we've already moved uh, you know, a large degree, um, probably 80% of what we'll do off the lows from at least last fall. We probably need to have a little bit more into the fall, and I think we'll likely consolidate which ties in with a lot of the seasonality that happens most election years. You know, usually the market will peak in August, September. We have mild consolidation, and then after the election, when there's a lot more clarity, usually uh, that's a very bullish time for stock indices. So I think potentially that's when our time when small caps finally, you know, begin to work. The day for small caps. I think, uh, you know, it's interesting. We've seen a 50 basis point drop in yields, but, you know, small caps still really haven't done all that well. and. Slowly but surely, you're seeing evidence of financials and industrials and discretionary healthcare start to show a little bit of strength, but it's still very much, you know, the market's been camouflaged by, by technology for all the right reasons. These are companies that have changed our lives for the better, and these stocks are still the ones that are working yeah. very, very well, and the companies are making a lot of money. Absolutely. We're seeing this massive tech rally, and you're saying it's going to last a little longer, but we're going to see other things break out, hopefully small caps. That's right. How does an investor pick their next sector, let's say? I'm not going to say stock, but yeah. we're so tech-focused. You're getting to our word of the day, yeah. rotation. Oh, well, we can do that. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. So how do, how do we find locate these sectors that might get some attention here? Well, the good news for all of us is that we can embrace what you know I've been doing for 30 years, which is technical analysis and, and looking, at, <laughs> looking at you know charts and, and having those make the decisions for us as opposed to you know hoping that something comes back when the charts don't really tell us the picture. So you really want to make use of relative charts and watch for evidence of sector rotation and mm -hmm. start to see strengthening in certain sectors that would help to really put the odds in your favor towards thinking we're going to see outperformance. But e So even right now with tech still dominating, you know, a good rule of thumb is to diversify your portfolio, especially for people who are just kind of passively investing. Right. How does one diversify their portfolio when most of the gains are coming from tech? Ooh, yeah. Well, I guess the question is, why would you want to diversify the portfolio if everything is being led by tech and it's working? I mean, look, there's, there's two schools of thought there. One is diversify your portfolio, but in this case, that's going to mean investing in things that aren't working. Uh, the other way to do it is to put everything into tech and watch it very carefully. So put all your eggs in one basket and, and watch it like a hawk. Obviously, it doesn't make sense for, for many people given their risk tolerance or time horizon. So, you know, yeah, you have to spread it amongst sectors such as, you know, one of my favorites is industrials. I came into the yeah. year being positive in that group. It moved to new, 
you know, decade highs relative to the S&P. There are a lot of reasons why that sector was starting to work well. Uh, you, you mentioned something relative to the S&P, so I just want to kind of hone into that. Yep. There are a couple of different methods of calculating relative strength, but real simply, you could take a stock like Boeing and, and compare it to its industrial bar benchmark by uh, just dividing BA over XLI, and that right. gives you the relative strength of Boeing with respect to industrials. Is that what you're talking about? And then what are you measuring specifically? Yeah, most times, you know, you want to try to always focus on those stocks that are showing very good relative strength uh, compared to their own sector. In this case, Boeing relative to the industrials. Boeing has not been a good performer no, relative no, it, to its benchmark. It but also, once you find that list, you find ones that are trading within, you know, 10% of their all-time highs or at least 52-week highs, and you can start to, sh you know, do some more relative analysis. Relative in this case, meaning take the stocks relative to the S&P. And, and honestly, you want to take it versus the equated S&P, or else you're just basically saying, how is my stock going to do versus tech? Mm -hmm. Because the S&P is so tech-focused. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, to, to your point earlier, a lot of different ways to measure relative strength. Most investors think of RSI, Relative Strength Index, which largely just measures the strength of a, a stock against its own prior history, right. similar to throwing a baseball up and gradually seeing it drop. And you know, there are ways to measure momentum. In this case, you know, investors always want to see, are you involved with the right stock? Is there another stock that might be better that's actually and working better on, than your, your current, you know, yeah. the only one so you're So if it's choosing. on the horizon, you might even see that, okay, if you're taking a price like Boeing relative to the equal weighted S&P, it might not have broken out yet, but, or uh, excuse me, price-wise, but you may see the relative strength gaining. And so that gives you a clue. And you know, back to your point, you're looking for the next sector that's hot. You can see these things kind of percolating uh, in the sector level relative before they break out in price themselves. I, I would usually caution investors towards trying to uh, you know, truly buy low to sell high and think that you've captured the absolute low of any sort of sector that you're hoping is going to be the next big thing. because. You know, many times these laggard groups, they take quite a bit and, and a while for them to start to really strengthen. And, you know, any stock that's at or near 52-week lows is really going to have a difficult time at clawing back. So I, I'm almost always of the school that you buy high, sell higher, uh, sell low or avoid low and cover lower versus thinking that, um, you know, you're going to be able to buy something that's at its lows just because of valuation purposes and you've ended up timing it correctly. And that's where a lot of investors go wrong. I mean, I think a few years ago, everybody said, well, China is incredibly cheap and China you know, what? It remains got struggling and nobody yeah. knows the demand picture, but it's, it's having a difficult time. And even small caps. I mean, my own boss, Tom Lee, has spoken at great length about how attractive small caps are from a valuation perspective. But, you know, you need to utilize technical analysis, which is what I do. So he and I work well as a team. I think in general, it helps to rip the blindfold off of really, <laughs> yeah. you know, bringing to life, or is this really the time that your your fundamental thesis can work? Are we seeing that actually in volume? And is, is, is the chart starting to, to make sense? Or is it just a long-term idea, you know, that hopefully will work? Mark, can I ask you, you say buy high, sell higher. Mm -hmm. So for something like NVIDIA today, mm -hmm. and I, you don't necessarily need to say if you would buy it, but if a stock is doing really well, mm -hmm. like NVIDIA, and it's showed for the past year, two years, is it still a time to buy today, right. or should you wait for it to come down a little bit? You know, honestly, a lot of those questions depend on your own risk tolerance and your time frame. I, I would just argue, you know, it's important to pay attention to people like William O'Neill, uh, you know, who created Investor's Business Daily. He wrote a book called How to Make Money on Stocks. Combination and, of fundamentals and technicals. You know, typically he, he advised that some of his greatest investments for all time happened after a stock had moved to new all-time high territory. So he looked at those stocks that went up one, two, three, four hundred percent or more, and typically that happens as a stock. You know, you know, usually the stock has to show evidence of price strength before sometimes these larger moves happen. So to answer your question, sometimes when the horse gets out of the barn, you have to go chase it because it might not come back. Uh, I own Nvidia. I've been an investor in Nvidia, but but. Uh, you know, some of my analysis suggests that in the months ahead that it might be wise to consider diversifying. I haven't seen that on the charts just yet, but, but uh, you know, I'm paying attention to several different things. For now, you know, technology in general still makes a lot of sense to me. 
So potential rotation on the, high, on the horizon, which leads us to our phrase of the day here. We talked about it before, rotation. And in finance, I'm going to give you uh, the dictionary definition. In finance, rotation refers to the practice of moving investments from one sector of the economy to the other, attempting to capitalize on the varying performance of sectors during different economic phases of the business cycle. So what are, what's a business cycle? We're talking about the boom-bust cycle of the economy. And a lot of it has to do with what consumers and builder businesses are doing when they see certain signs. So are people retrenching? Are they getting greedy? Do they have dollar signs in their eyes? So what does rotation mean to you? Well, I think you've done a great job explaining it. I, obviously, uh, ro rotation in the stock market just refers to, you know, exiting a sector that is done poorly as it starts to gradually show more strength and, and, and it participates in the rally and, and vice versa. Oftentimes you see uh, sectors that have done well that start to give way and, and weaken. So, you know, we all know that this year has not been the year of the consumer. We've seen economic growth start to show ever so slight evidence of waning along the fringes and uh, most of the consumer oriented groups have shown abysmal performance be it either consumer discretionary with stocks like Nike for example or Starbucks and many of these are affected by the price of commodities that have hurt you know Hershey's was affected by the chocolate boom and the same thing with okay, Starbucks yeah. with coffee so you know, it's 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 premature for me to say that uh, the consumer is is tapped out, but but I think there certainly you're seeing evidence in the stock market that you know the consumer area is not necessarily the best area to favor right now. It's certainly out of favor, uh, and the majority of defensive issues that are non AI related are also out of favor. Being consumer staples, uh, the REIT sector, utilities, utilities have strengthened uh, and a lot of that strength was just due to AI and power centers, but really there is no evidence of any sort of defensive type push to the market, which for me gives me a sense of great optimism for the next six to eight months as to why markets should still go higher because people really aren't. The pessimism uh, is, is not there with, with the effect of how we're, we're witnessing that within the stock market and, and the actual, uh, you know, there has been no rotation. And, and who's to say that there will be rotation? That's a big... Like, it doesn't have to happen. Like, why, you know, why should we exit uh, an AI-led boom in technology to think that, you know, all of a sudden small caps are going to start to lead or any other group? So we have to really witness that and have sufficient proof before we say, okay, this rotation is happening. And yes, it might be wise to begin to diversify you can't say that based on three days of decline in NVIDIA, where it loses $300 billion and then it but goes straight day, back Three up. days of declining NVIDIA, that, that the world could be falling by that. It but, could, but the S&P is only down 1% within a few days, so yes. really nothing happened, right? So Exactly. Yeah. Well, we need to take a short break here. This episode being brought to you by the number 4.5%, and that is the level on the 10-year yield that it is surging towards today, just a few bips short. And this gives us a chance to talk about the Fed. Um, Mar uh, Mark, let me ask you, long term, you're expecting lower yields on the tenure, I believe. Um, what do you make of the latest jump here? Just short-term noise or what's going on? I do believe it's short-term noise. I believe part of it was uh, window dressing, um, cleaning up the balance sheets towards the end of quarter. And, yeah, and also, I think that there's uh, a potential read-through that the debates last week caused some thinking that... Uh, uh, you know, Trump might continue to gain ground on Biden and there might be might potential be tariffs in, in the future. And so you have to think that that, uh, you know, could cause an increase in inflation. Obviously, less competition means that, uh, you know, prices in general go up over time. So bond yields, I think, temporarily are responding to that. But I, I think my own view is that Powell's speech tomorrow with Lagarde mm. should help to reinforce the dovishness, which I think is right in this economy, where the economy has been weakening versus expectations now really for the last six months. And you look at just the Citigroup index of, you know, how that, how every day's Economics economic data, that's right, economic data versus expectations, and it's at new two-year lows. So really everything the across the good. board, yeah. even this morning's data uh, missed yet again. So. You know, that doesn't mean we're in crisis mode. The economy is, has been in pretty good shape for a few years, but you're definitely seeing evidence of, uh, you know, both disinflationary trends uh, accelerating, which should be a good thing, and also uh, ever so slight evidence of the housing market starting to falter a bit and the labor market we're seeing, you know, 
increasingly more layoffs, not, not mass unemployment, but in general some, as I say, weakness on the fringe. It's caused rates to start to really roll over pretty sharply over the last few months. Mm -hmm. My thinking is the 10-year gets down under 4% uh, into the fall, and that should drive a risk-on rally for, you know, just given the recent correlations of how risk assets have performed, stocks have performed well, given the thinking, not because the economy is weakening, but because it makes the market more closely aligned with when the Fed's going to start to cut rates. Right. And any thinking the Fed's going to cut rates in July, that might be seem far-fetched, but I, I definitely think we'll see some signs in September. Uh, Powell likely should reinforce that this week, that we're the next big move is obviously to cut rates. We're right. not going to hike rates. And, yeah. and, and that wasn't really taken into account on the last dot plot after the last Fed meeting. I think he's going to use this uh, specifically as a time to address that. Right. And, and most traders are anticipating a September rate cut. Is one rate cut, a 25 basis point cut, going to make a big difference to investors? No, it certainly won't. And, and honestly, yeah. You know, this touches on a larger point that, that you know, the Fed's whole notion of, of being data dependent, you know, many of these rate cuts or rate hikes like we've seen in the last couple of years, you know, over, what, 550 basis points of rate hikes, you know, they take 12 to 18 months sometimes to filter through the economy. They don't the just... The long and variable It's lags. not just you, you, you cut rates once or you rate, and all of a sudden that's going to be a, a disastrous. Uh, I just think the notion that uh, rates are going to start to fall on the front end uh, generally is, you know, something that the market should embrace. I mean, we've done our job. Inflation's been cut in half. Yes, it's still difficult. Food and gas prices are, are incredibly high, and, and that impacts a lot of people. Uh, it certainly is going to be an election issue, but I, I think that, um, you know, car insurance can't continue to go up 3 or 4% a month. and and, and the shelter part of that is going to start to turn down if what you know my own boss Tom Lee is saying is correct. Mark, I think I asked that also because it seems like we're so reactive to every data point mm. that comes out or every prediction someone makes about what the jobs right. report is going to look like, when the Fed is going to cut rates. And so I think for me, it seems more of a mental or emotional thing for investors to react to this first rate cut. Well, look, I think a lot of investors grew up thinking that uh, fundamentals and or Fed policy largely drive the stock market. And I would here say that's absolutely not the case. I think that a lot of that is cycles and sentiment that cause the larger turns. Um, it's certainly helpful to have uh, you know, easy monetary policy, some signs of cutting rates. Uh, you know, the market seems to embrace uh, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those things that, that it can be helpful. But um, yeah, it's an interesting time for sure. Well, we'd love to talk about the Fed, but we are going to move on to uh, our last segment of the day, who wore it better. And today we have two top level sectors battling out for bra bragging rights on consolidation. And what that means is we're going to be looking at large cap financials versus large cap industrials. Uh, that's going to be XLF versus XLI. Both of their year to date charts, they look very similar. A peak in April, followed by another peak in May. Both are trading sidewise, but who is setting up better for the next move? Who is wearing the technical consolidation better? Is it the industrials or the financials, Mark? I'm in favor of industrials starting to lead out of this for, I guess, a few important reasons. One is that, you know, we are uh, heading into summertime. You see the transportation stocks, uh, you know, should be starting to kick into gear, particularly with lower energy prices. So that's going to benefit some of the cruise liners, some of the airlines, and I think that'll be helpful. Transportation has been a sector that has lagged over the last year. Um, but, you know, we look at you know, in my own view, um, just uh, when you look at relative strength of how industrials, um, not based on XLI per se, but maybe mm -hmm. based on equal weighted industrials, how that looks versus the S&P, uh, it's still quite attractive. Um, conversely, financials, if the economy is going to start to weaken and rates are going to start to drop, that shouldn't be good for banks per se as much, um, you know, being able to... Uh, you know, borrow, you know, borrow and lend at, at different areas of the curve that obviously would favor rates being a little bit higher than lower for financial strength. I'm also disappointed with the strength in, in regional banks, and that really, really has never 
been been realized. I mean, that, that group has certainly been a big disappointment. And so that's a big part of financials, not necessarily a big part of XLF per se. That's going to be yeah, your JP maybe. Morgans or your Berkshire Hathaways. And I have no technical issues with those those stocks and those companies. I think that they're very well positioned. So I, I'm not opposed to the large cap, you know, money center banks. It's more I have an issue with the regional banks that potentially could be tied to, to commercial real estate, uh, other areas that are Some suffering not only in the U.S. but also globally that uh, just make financials not as an attractive sector to me going forward versus industrials. Mark, we're going to switch gears here a little bit. Big switch? Yeah, big, big switch. Uh, you joined, you were at Diamondback Capital Management, uh, where there was an FBI raid. This was, what was it, 2012? 2010. 2010. I definitely wasn't paying attention at that time. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your experience then? Okay. So, well, at the time, you know, we had emerged from a recession back in the, the, the banking uh, crisis, the, the bear market from 2007 to 2009. And as we headed into 2010, the stock market had recovered, but the economy really had not. And it had really been, uh, you know, sort of uh, not nearly gaining as much momentum. So, you know, the thinking was that all these banks are making big bonuses, and there was real concern, I think, among the administration at the time as to why that was happening. They felt like the economy wasn't doing so well. Um, largely, you know, naivete about just how hedge funds work when you run, you know, eight billion dollars and you're you're you have a fee structure of two and twenty, and you're you're making a lot of money for a lot of the right reasons. You're making investors' money. Uh, but people, it still wasn't a good optical image at the time for, I think, it was a really tough Main time. Street yeah. for, for people to look and, and hear about, uh, you know, people making big bonuses and, and, and at a time when, when I think the Main Street was still largely struggling. So, you know, a number of different hedge funds, um, based on the direction of Preet Bharara, uh, yes, actually were, were rated at the time. Southern District. Mine, anymore. myself, Level Global, Diamondback, which was formed from a few people who used to work with SAC, uh, Steve Cohen's firm that now is 0.72. So uh, I was managing money at the time. I'd been an analyst for a few years. And, and uh, yeah, it was a, an interesting time. I, I think that, uh, you know, we all realized that it was a little bit of a witch hunt. Of course, they ended up not being able to prove anything. One of the cases was taken to the Supreme Court and overturned. Um, so uh, the firm had a bit of black eye, just given the duty to its constituents, and, and uh, the firm had to be shut down. But largely, uh, you know, uh, everybody was exonerated. There was no, no charges there. But it, it certainly changed my life. Uh, I'm sure. At the time, going from, you know, I, I'd worked a, a stint on the floor as a an options trader at the CBOE for a while, and I worked at Morgan Stanley, and so to join Diamondback was one of the most prestigious, largest hedge funds in the world. Stevie and, Cohen, yeah. So uh, formed based on a number of people from Steve Cohen's firm. And so, you know, it, it uh, as with anybody that's worked in the financial services business over the last 30 years, it's more of a two steps forward, one step back. But yeah, to, to answer your question, I guess initially, uh, it's incredibly scary when you see <laughs> Uh, a raid happening, and, and you're not sure why it's happening or, or, or what's going on and who's responsible. And, and Mark, uh, we got under yeah. a minute. Any any final words for investors here about anything? Well, look, I would just say it's important to, to tune out the news to the extent that you're able. You know, technology is, uh, you know, is, is in a secular bull market. It's very, very difficult to avoid these companies just because one thinks that they're overbought when they're all still continuing to change our lives at a very rapid pace. So I think you have to embrace the AI boom. Embrace the AI boom. We're going to leave it there. Mark Noon, really appreciate you stopping by here. And Sidney Freed, as always, keep your dial tuned to Yahoo Finance.